Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly Q&A session. So if you've got any tech-related mountain bike questions, fire them in to the email address on the bottom of the screen, or you can add those comments in the descriptions below. Uh, if you're emailing us, just use that Ask GMBN Tech hashtag in your subject header, just so we can identify them and chuck them in for next week's show. So first up this week is from Jake Evans. I've got a question. So if you're setting a bike up tubeless the cheat way by using extra layers of rim tape, could you theoretically use Schrader valves like they use in cars? Um, not the cheap ones, the actual automotive ones that you pull through the wheels. Ooh, that's a good shout. Um, I want to run tubeless, but I want to run Schrader valves as I prefer them. I mean, you could put air and sealant through them, so it shouldn't be an issue, surely. Um, one second, I'm just gonna check one of these. Yeah, as I thought, okay. Um, all right, so on the screen now, you can see what I'm looking at here. So this is an automotive, just a car tubeless, effectively a tubeless valve stem. So not too far off the ones that we have for mountain bikes. Now, although this one is a Presto one, not a Schrader one, the principle is the same. When it goes into the rim, you have this little rubber grommet or O-ring that sits up against the rim and then you have a retaining nut just to hold it in place. And basically, if there are any air leaks, it seals against that and no air can escape and the valve can't move, which of course, if you could move that valve accidentally, um, you can lose all your air. Now with the automotive one, um, unless there's a threaded one that's got thread all the way down, I don't think you can because you can't fit a retaining nut like this to it. However, if you were insistent on wanting to run Schrader valves and there's nothing wrong with that, they work great, stands actually make some tubeless specific Schrader valves and they are threaded all the way on the outside. So you can just get those if you wanna use your existing rims. But a good shout on the automotive ones. I might try and order a few sets just to see if there's any variations. And if they work, I'll let everyone know, but um, I'm not sure they will as they are. All right, next up is from Julian Grimaldi. Doddy, loving the channel. Thank you, Julian. Um, what difference in the bike behavior would it make by putting a 140 mil fork on a hardtail designed for a maximum of 120 mil travel. A friend of mine wants to add, um, a friend of mine wants to sell me his brand new 140 mil Pike RCT3 at basically half the price I can find it anywhere else. Uh, my bike's a Specialized Rock Hopper Pro. It came with a 100 mil uh, Manitou Markor. Um, I found myself out of shock travel pretty frequently and I'd love to have a bit more. Greetings from Argentina. Okay, so, um, a result of putting a longer fork on your bike, you will raise that bottom bracket height slightly, you will slacken your seat angle, which means it won't feel quite as nice when you're going up the hills because it pitches your weight back further. Uh, you can compensate by putting your saddle nose down slightly and running your saddle slightly more forwards. Um, and another downside that's also an upside is it will slacken your head angle and raise the front end of your bike. So granted, you could lower your stem slightly or get a lower rise bar to compensate. Um, but as an upside, it will feel really good on the descents, having that more control on the front of your bike. Now, I was just looking at some lengths of axle to crown. So that is the measurement of the, the entire length of a fork. Now you say your bike is designed for a maximum of 120 mil. Um, if we look at a 120 mil fork, so on screen now is a little chart. So a 120 mil, 27 and a half RockShox fork, axle to crown is 493 millimeters. Now a 140 version, axle to crown is 521, so that's 30 millimeters higher. That's quite a lot higher than that 120 mil fork, which is quite a lot higher than the 100 you already have on there. So I would actually check out if you can shorten the travel on that bike on that bike first. If you can run it at 120, happy days. Um, of course, there's nothing stopping you running it a bit higher, but the extremity of going from 100 mil to 140 mil will really change the feeling of your bike, uh, and I'm not sure it will be for the better. Okay, so next up, this is a really cool one. This is from Didac Carbasa, uh, or Carbasa. Uh, sorry if I got that wrong. Um, I'd like to know how a free coaster dirt hub works. I've seen many riders uh, using these, so basically it means they can pedal when they go faking the hub, the hub doesn't engage. Can you please explain how it works? Um, I can't show you because I don't have one here to take apart and show you, but essentially on a traditional mountain bike hub, if I get one of these out, um, the cassette of the hub, that basically the sprockets, they slide onto something like this, and this will have pulls on it that when you pedal, they basically engage onto serrated teeth on the hub, turning the hub and propelling the wheel. When you stop pedaling, these springs go in and out like this, these little sprung pulls, enabling it to free wheel. 
So on a free coaster hub, you can freewheel in both directions and it works completely differently. And in fact, I got some spare parts actually to fix a warp with jacket and it came in this and I kept this because I thought this would come in handy at some point. So a free coaster hub is a completely different kettle of fish in the way it works. So let's just say the sprocket is mounted onto this piece which has a thread on it. Now the inside of the hub shell will have a cone like profile and it's basically like a clutch on the inside that enables it to engage and grip so you can pedal. Let's say that this is that piece, but it's shaped like this also. So when you pull it into the hub, it can grip. And the way it works is simply, as you pedal, it engages onto this and it pulls it into the hub. As you freewheel, it undoes itself and disengages, enabling the, the basically the freewheeled action to happen in both directions. Uh, kind of a hard thing to explain without having one in my hand, but that is the essentials of how a free coaster BMX style hub works. And then you can take up the slack, the, the amount of slack you have can be adjusted. So you can have it so it's very close or very loose. Now, something that you will find with a free coaster hub compared to a typical mountain bike hub is the engagement of a mountain bike hub can be like as little as three degrees. It could be like almost instantaneous. A free coaster hub, you can have like almost half a revolution before it engages. And that's because it's got to pull itself back in again. So uh, that's the basic principle of how a free coaster hub works. As scary as anything, uh, but they do enable you to do some really cool tricks. But no one currently makes a dedicated mountain bike version that's got these sort of internals on them. The sort of stuff you tend to see most people using, like the 50 to 1 guys, uh, they'll have a blank sprocket on their cassettes. So they'll take off, say, the 11 tooth at the bottom, have a blank sprocket, and they'll change gear so the chain drops onto that, and the chain actually just revolves around that. So it's effectively decoupled from the, the cassette of the hub. Um, in fact, Neil ran this exact setup on his bike to do a little test a while ago, except he wasn't doing it to get the benefit of the free coaster going backwards concept. He was doing it to disconnect the suspension from the transmission so you can get an idea of how a bike feels when you're basically when it hasn't got a chain on it. Um, if you want to watch that video, I'm going to put a link to it in the description below because it's really quite cool. And there's actually a couple of videos going up on GMBN soon basically how to set up a free coach set and Chris Smith is going to show you how to do all those tricks. So keep your eyes out for those in the coming weeks. Okay, next up is from Philip Schmidt. Um, I know that the Cannondale Lefty Forks use needle bearing packs to not only keep the inner leg from twisting, but because it offers a much higher torsional stiffness and reduces stiction. I can see that this is not necessary on a conventional fork, but wouldn't it also stand to benefit from needle bearings or some other sort of linear bearing. Is there a reason why no one does this besides cost or weight? Um, I think you pretty much nailed it there, cost and weight, um, I reckon. So the lefty actually came from a twin leg fork originally called, the, I think it was the Moto FR. Now, rumor is that it was so stiff anyway that the mechanics like, <laughs> you could probably run this with one leg and that's basically how they developed the lefty because it was so stiff that they only needed one leg basically to accomplish what they, they wanted to do. But that fork was, honestly, it was completely bomb proof. And it had, well, it's a six inch travel fork, I think it was. Now it's really popular amongst tandem riders that run off road tandems because it's the stiffest fork you can pretty much get and it will never ever break. Um, but it cost a fortune to develop because those bearing surfaces have to be so well made, whereas churning out stanchions on forks is a lot cheaper by comparison and fork bushings are a lot cheaper and they're very easy to replace they're very fast to replace i know for a fact that a lot of the mechanics i've worked with in the past as soon as you mention a canada lefty service to them you just hear oh and you hear the excuses oh i'm just going home to sleep. literally people don't want to know um so it's such a love hate product um i'm a huge fan as you probably know anyway um I'd be interested if anyone has ever worked on something like this, but I just think there's no need for it. No need for the additional complications that you can get from that system. Of course, Lefty is mastered. Now they've done, they've got the Ocho, which has got the three-sided system, so it's substantially lighter, easier to work on, but still it's a very, very expensive fork. And I can't see a way of making that work on a twin leg fork, despite how well it would work. All right, next up is from Boomerang Freak. I recognize your name seen you before asking questions i'm fairly sure um hey dolly is it just me or is there so few center lock hubs out there 
It seems that most brands don't bother about a center lock and go for traditional six bolt disc mounting. Would there be any reason for this at all, as I don't know or care from a maintenance perspective, um, is center lock the better option? Um, I'm looking for a set of wheels I can, I, I can use to build, uh, looking for a set of hubs I can use to build wheels. I'd love to have them with center lock discs as most of my other bikes also use those. It'd be easier, let's say, for swapping out damaged rotors between bikes. Um, I've got mixed feelings about center lock. I love how it looks. It looks so nice and simple. I love the way you use a cassette tool to, to crank them on there. It's really good, but they can rattle loose. Um, of course, you can get around that using little bits of thread lock, but it doesn't help when you're riding someone else's bike that's got that on and it ends up rattling loose, a bit of a pain. Um, I had a quick look online. There's actually quite a few brands out there that do offer center lock hubs. So starting first up is a Hope RS4 hub. So they're, they're center lock compatible. Next up, of course, DT Swiss. So uh, very much been in bed with Shimano from the beginning with the whole center lock thing. So they have that on most of their wheels. Of course, there's Shimano. There's another one on the screen. Then comes the cool stuff. So Industry 9. So they've got their hubs available in center lock. Super nice hubs. In fact, their wheel sets are lovely as well. Then you've got White Industries, another sort of premium brand. Um, Onyx or Onyx, um, the brand that make the silent clutch type super fast engagement BMX hubs. They also do center lock. And perhaps my favorite, and if I could have any hub right now on the list, um, probably the Chris Kings, to be honest, but um, you do need a lot of money for Chris King hubs, they're very expensive. Um, I'm gonna be taking a look at some Chris King hubs soon, actually, and headsets next. I wanna explain exactly why they're so expensive, because um, they are insanely expensive when you look at them compared to other products, but those in the know know why they're expensive and I wanna share that knowledge with you guys. So from Angus McLean, this question is for Dolly. I was looking on Pinkbike the other day and found a post on Chinese carbon frames. They look really nice and seem to be really cheap. Are they too good to be true? Um, if so, what are the downsides? Um, you know, I was actually looking on AliExpress the other day and some of the other sort of direct sites like this, and it's pretty funny some of the stuff you can see on there. I saw a set of forks, uh, they were 120 mil travel, they look at a glance like a pair of uh, Fox 32s. The stanchions on them were like, um, they look very similar, should we say, to Kashima, a slightly different color. And then they had what appeared to be RockShox stickers on them that said fork shocks. So uh, I, I don't know what, what was inside those things. And actually, I think I want to start buying some of this stuff. Um, I need to get a bit of budget signed off for that, but I want to buy a bunch of stuff and actually check it out because it's so easy to buy this stuff that I do know people are doing it. And I actually worry about the safety thing myself. So when you're buying from a brand that's already established, they've had their stuff tested to standard so you know it is safe and it's fit for purpose. When you're buying this other stuff, you might get a really good bargain from a direct Chinese brand. But at the same time, you don't really know what you're getting. So you can get something really good or you can get something that you're gonna need a new set of teeth afterwards. So honestly, I don't know. I'm staying out of this. I don't wanna recommend anything, but I wanna find this out for myself and I wanna do a feature on buying this sort of stuff because it is something that does need to be addressed because in the past, there have been lots of problems with fake components on the market. I know, for example, the Specialized have a whole division of people, staff on their team, that take care of counterfeit products, which is a big problem for a brand like that. So in all seriousness, it is something we're gonna look into doing here at GMBN Tech. So I think it's a really good feature, it's fun. We're gonna see what it's all cracked up to be, and if it's actually, if it is as good as it sounds like it is. But generally, you know the saying, if it looks too good to be true, it normally is. So um, I'd be cautious on that one myself, but you might get yourself a bargain. Okay, and last up this week is from Joseph Tinsay. Uh, is there a difference between the Teflon coated cable compared to the stock cable? Um, you're obviously referring to gear in the cables. Um, yeah, basically a Teflon coated cable is just gonna remain operating a little bit smoother for a little bit longer in typical uh, usage. So most cables are stainless steel and they will slide nice and smoothly through the outer housing, but outer housing can ingest gunk, which hampers that. And of course, then you get the non-stainless, the cheaper inner cables, and they can actually corrode slightly, so you get yourself into, right, I'll pickle those over time with the amount of crap that they just ingest into the system. So a Teflon cable will definitely last a little bit longer and go a little bit smoother. Um, although, to be honest, I use stainless ones. I just look after my bike, make sure I've got ferrules on everything. And I think really the only way to go to make them totally maintenance-free 
is to get a dedicated sealed system. Now, Fibrax make them. There's one on screen there. Gore actually used to make them. I'm not sure if they still do, but they make completely sealed cable systems. And they've got like an inner liner. They're, they're amazing things. They cost quite a lot of money, but if you really suffer with that sort of uh, problems with cable shifting in, let's just say, uh, winter conditions, then maybe a system like this is really good for you. I used to run the Fibrax system, and I was amazed how long it stayed working well for, you know, jet washing the bike, generally not paying much attention to it, no problems with shifting um, whatsoever. So uh, that's fundamentally a difference, but a stainless cable will do the job just as well. Uh, you just might need a little bit more maintenance. So there we go, there's another Q&A session in the back. If you've got any questions or any comments, leave them in those comments below. Let us know what you think, let us know what you wanna know. Uh, for a couple more tech related videos, hit them up right down there in the bottoms of the screen. And of course, don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you like the channel and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Cheers guys.